Thank you, Brother Aaron, for those kind, kind words. And greetings, kings and priests. Amen. Share us together in this abundant salvation. It's true that these refreshing waters, conferences, or seminars have meant so, so much to Clara and I. Now, I think uh, 10, 11 times. Uh, rising us up with such joy and peace of mind. We don't even have to strain our necks to look up. We're already up. It's, just, it's like we're on the mountain of the Lord's house. Or maybe God's just removed our stiff-necked and uncircumcised heart. And it just seems such a pleasure. It, it's, I don't want to call it a vacation, but it is a refreshing to us better than any vacation that we've ever taken. We used to take big vacations sometimes go to Australia six weeks or South Africa for five weeks or something like this. But since the refreshing water of this is, you know, two or three days of this equivalent to six weeks anywhere. So it's <laughs> something that we so thoroughly, thoroughly enjoy. Uh, I do want to acknowledge to the Elders and Dale and all the congregation here are our deep appreciation. Yes. 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 I go to the kitchen and say thank you, but they say uh, everybody's so busy, I'm afraid you don't know how deeply we appreciate it. Yes. You know, Southern hospitality, if it didn't begin in North Carolina, it was refined right here. Yes. <laughs> yes. It was really developed. Uh, and I praise you for it. I remember. Uh, early story of hospitality in my family. Actually, it was a great aunt of mine, great, great something. And her father, my great grandfather, in 1792, there's two chariots uh, or uh, cart pulled by horses pulled up in front of the big house. There is maybe 30, 40 minutes out of uh, Salisbury and. Uh, the coachman knocked on the door. And, uh, my ancestor answered the door of a 12 year old girl, uh, Elizabeth McCarthy. And she opened the door and asked what she could do. He says, I have eight people here that are very hungry. And she, he says, Is your parents hungry? He says, No. They got up early and left to go to Salisbury to hear President George Washington speak. She says, I had to stay home and take care of the younger children. He says, well, we were hungry. She says, my family believes in hospitality, and I have been taught even at my age to entertain strangers. And you come in and I will feed you. He was taken back and he says, uh, did you not want to go hear the president speak? She says, oh, I would have loved to, but my parents asked me to take care of the young, younger children. He says, I'll tell you what I'm going to do for the hospitality that you've shown. I'm going to assure you that you get to see the president even before your parents did. She said, well, I can't leave the house. He said, that's all right. As he turned, said, Mr. President, come in. Hospitality is here at the McCarthy's house. Amen. And so the president and his entourage come in and eat breakfast, then travel the next 30 minutes to Salisbury to speak to her parents and the others that had assembled. But hospitality in North Carolina is alive and well, and I thank you for it. Because it hasn't always been here. North Carolina itself was just a crown colony of the British Empire, which was really ruled by the Babylonian Church of England, who chose on one occasion to take another ancestor of mine, a grandfather, or whatever, tied him to the stake and beat him with lashes for the seditious, criminal act of preaching immersion 
for baptism. Well, praise God, he never quit preaching it. <laughs> but he found green pastures in central Tennessee <laughs> and on to the northern part of Louisiana where he established many, many congregations who still practice immersion for baptism. You know, I've often wondered, as the Apostle Paul suffered at the hands <coughs> of his enemies and was beaten five times, at least, for preaching good news, yeah. Yeah. what in the world would happen to the prophets that often had to preach bad news. <laughs> oh, what a disaster that was for many of them in the physical realm. You know, when the Holy Spirit said to Isaiah, He said, you go and you tell those people, hear him, you shall hear and you won't understand. See him, you shall see, and you will not perceive. As we would say in East Texas, you have a bunch of dumbness and besides that, you blind. <laughs> <laughs> well, what kind of is that bad news? <laughs> well, praise God, He wasn't speaking to you. You've got a more sure word of prophecy, right? Amen. And the day is dawn. That day starts risen in our hearts. We don't have to be blind and dumb. But poor Isaiah, he had to keep preaching sometimes some bad news. But you will cry for sorrow of heart. You're going to howl for vexation of spirit. You're going to leave your name for a curse. And the Lord's going to slay you. Well, praise God, He wasn't talking to you, was He? No, I don't howl for vexation of spirit. Why, well, I'm rejoicing in the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm worshiping God in the Spirit, putting no confidence in the flesh. Oh, my, my. Isaiah, I a lot of bad news. I thank my God and His Christ that our commission is to preach the good news. To proclaim the good news. Because even as Isaiah taught me, the farmer troubles are all forgotten. Hid from God's eyes. There's no more bad news that we have to proclaim. Yet contrast that to Brother Isaiah. He had to deal with his sin problem with the servant of God. And after dealing with that, he waxed very bold by the question of God, who shall I send? He said, send me. So he, God sent to preach often. You're obtuse. You're ignorant. You're blind. You're deaf. And so the prophet Isaiah with the other prophets lived a cut wrenching life. Tear stained, heart rending, comfort with pride, peer rejected according to the flesh. I tell you what, I'm, I, I may not do this, but it's hard for me to think of meeting Isaiah and not falling on my knees. Yes. I mean, it's hard. Yes. Yet I say, yet I say, but now God, yet I say, with all the other prophets was immensely blessed. And why? Because God did nothing without making it known to his prophets and especially the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. They caught glimpses of the Spirit of Christ who was the heart and soul and glory of their prophetic message. So while Isaiah was a bearer of much bad news, he was a bearer of even more good news. So where bad news abounds, good news does much more abound even by the prophet Isaiah. Now let's just look at a few examples of that principle. The ox knows his owner, but Israel, mine own people, has no knowledge of me. You're a sinful nation, loaded with iniquity. And yet it wasn't but just a few verses later. It said, come now, let's read it again. Though your sins be scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Bad news, good news. Your men are going to fall with the sword. The mighty men in war. Her gates are going to lament and mourn. And she's been desolate. So sit upon the ground. Yet just a few verses later. In that day shall the branch of the Lord be beautiful and glorious. The fruit of the earth be excellent and comely. He that remaineth in Jerusalem 
It's going to be called holy. Bad news, good news. Again, Isaiah says that faithful cities become a hard. Why, your judges are murderers. Your princes are rebellious. Five verses later, the city was one of righteousness. A faithful city. Judgment restored. Sign with them. Bad news, good news. Again, my people are dwindling away. They are all unawares. Again, we would say, ignorant. Nobles are starving to death. Common folks are dying of thirst. Yet, not long after the people that walked in darkness unaware saw a great light. Now has increased their joy and them great gladness. Can you see even Isaiah, a gospel preacher, though he had to proclaim bad news, the good news did much more about it. When you read Isaiah, if you hadn't found Christ on every page of his prose and poetry, you need some ears to hear. Amen. One more bad news, good news, and we're into my text. Now see, we're talking about feast of fat things tonight in case you <laughs> haven't forgotten my scripture. But we're going to set the table. Okay, here's the bad news. Your sacrifices, God says, what are they to me? I'm full up with your offerings and the fat thereof. I've no desire for the blood of your bulls. The offer of your gifts is useless. The reek of your sacrifices is a part I can endure your assemblies and your rituals. They are a burden to me. I will not put up with them any longer. Now there's a principle involved here. What man prepares with his hands in his offering to God, under his own power and under his own resources, God decides. Absolutely, God despises it. And God will not accept. And why would He accept them when He's already cursed them? Yes. Mm -hmm. How can someone think they can offer to God, even as a sacrifice, what God has already cursed? Therefore, your works of your hands and your offerings. Isaiah would categorically describe filthy rags. Right. So where does that leave us? Praise God, not destitute. That's the bad news. We got the good news in the text of my son. God says, now on this mountain, my mountain, the Lord of hosts shall prepare unto all people a feast of fat things, a feast of wines on the leaves, of fat things full of marble, of wines on the leaves, well refined, as one translation said, the Lord will prepare a banquet of rich fare for all the people. Mm -hmm. Well, now the, immediately it grabs me here that instead of us preparing a sacrifice, see God is preparing a sacrifice. Amen. Okay. We sacrifice from this accursed order but God is preparing from the heavenly order and sacrificing and preparing a rich fare. Now, to me, the rich fare bespeaks not only of abundance, but of quality in this abundance. Mm -hmm. Now, that's really and what I'm saying. God's not preparing a bunch of junk. He's not, he's not abundantly preparing junk. He's abundantly preparing something very rich. Mm -hmm. it, it, not only are the promises exceedingly great, but they're precious. Mm -hmm. All right, so we bespeak here tonight of the quality of this abundance. So what is this rich fare? What is a feast of that thing? I had to tell you right up front. My wife told me yesterday, that fat wasn't good for me. And I needed to not eat that fat. Now, it wasn't just yesterday that she told me that. She tells me that at least once a week. Sometimes it's sly, and sometimes it's just brazen. That fat's not good for you, don't it? Well, I, can't, I, I, I know she's correct. 
uh, it, it clogs my arteries, but and that's slow. But what, what happens when, when she eats it, it's not slow. She sits all night and will literally, up on eating fat, have to stay in the bathroom and throw it up all night long. So we know, and I believe it, but my counter to her, well, really, hon, everything this world has to offer is of little value and often harmful. So all we can do is accept what we have with humble hearts and thanks unto the giver of every good and precious gift. We appreciate life's bounties and God has blessed us. We appreciate the good hosts that's ministered to us, but honestly, we prefer the better thing. And the better thing here is that God is preparing and hosting this family. So we love the other host here. You understand. But there is the better thing. It is God preparing. It is God that is going to host it. And he more than that, he's offered it to all. See, and in this mountain shall the Lord of hosts make unto all people. What part of all don't you understand? <laughs> I think you may. All that. But it is on that mountain. Now, now, Paul probably liked Isaiah, but he put it in a modern translation and he called it the heavenly places. And so when we think of the mountain of the Lord's house, you well know that we're talking of the heavenly places that Paul has caused us to be raised up and to, to partake of the fatness thereof. Now, why is it raised up there? Because you can't get it here. You, in Adam is what I'm talking about. You can't get it in the worldly realm. You'll never get it in this realm. Now this is Isaiah 25. Now I know you can't get it in the earthly realm because Isaiah 24 described the earthly realm. Now let me just tell you in thumbnail sketch how he described what's here in this earth. Here is what the Lord's assessment of this earthly realm is. I'm going to empty this earth. I'm going to split it. I'm going to turn it upside down. The earth's empty. I'm going to strip it clean bare. It's dried up. It's withered. It grows sick. It's desecrated by the very feet of its inhabitants. A curse is devoured. It. Its inhabitants stand aghast. Revelers turn to sorrow. Shouts of joy can't be heard anymore. The earth is utterly shattered. The sins of man weigh heavy upon it. It falls to rise no more. Mm -hmm. I say good riddance. Say good riddance. The worldly order governed by the prince of the power of the air has never blessed me. Now you may think that's being a little harsh. <laughs> because oftentimes I thought it had blessed me. And it always proved a lie. Yes. And it made me a fool. So I repent in sackcloth and ashes thinking that this world of earth was ever a blessing. I say be gone. Fall to rise no more. Why should I work? Because I have been raised to sit in heaven's places. I am up there on the mountain of the Lord's house. Amen. So why should I worry about the earthly order of being destroyed? Now what makes this feast of fat things, such a rich fare. I hesitate, but I'm going to tell you anyway. I didn't hesitate long. I want you to know what this world serves you first before you eat the rich fare. Because if you don't know what the world is serving you, you may not even enjoy the rich fare. Let me tell you quickly what you partake of when you're in the world. And I know this, and I will develop it. But quickly, here's what the world has served each one of you as a diet. You are ignorant in this world. You are stupid. You are under despair. You weep. You are embarrassed. You are in bondage. And for dessert, you die. Now there's a sixth course for you. I don't dwell long here, but I, I want you to understand 
but you can't appreciate really the rich fare until you know what you can eat. And you got to know what you can eat. A lot of people eat and learn what to eat. But this is what the world is searching. This is the diabolical chef, Satan's menu. Mm -hmm. Is not ignorance the bane of human existence? The mind in Adam is so corrupted, it is incapable, no matter how it's educated, of clear thought. Ignorance in Scripture is always associated with sin. Mm -hmm. It was quoted today, my people perish for lack of knowledge, or my people perish because they're ignorant. That is just one of them. There are scores of them. You know, ironically, nearly every psychiatrist face <coughs> human problems to ignorance that stems from the inability to think clearly. Now, I'm going to tell you they're right, but I'm going to tell you their ignorance is believed in making purity. Yes. <laughs> On the yes. Amen. See, the Bible's very clear. It's God that gives a sound mind. Right. Second Timothy 1. Second course in this world's diet. Despair is a lot of human existence. The world in heaven is largely devoid of hope. At its best, it's just quiet desperation. Many think you've well, I, I, I found the answer here. They found drugs, or they found alcohol, or they found power abuse, or sexual abuse, or lust, or pride of life. But all of them, that diet proves to be greater abdication of reason and leads to greater and greater despair. If your realm, if your diet is of this present evil world, you are indeed without hope in this present world. Third course, weeping. Adam's race has been cries and pains of Abel's food game, excuse me, pains through Abel, or possibly before. There have been more tears shed than there has been blood shed, is my contention. It remains unabated. Both tears of righteousness and tears of unrighteousness. Humanity hurts. Is there a day that goes by that does not present you a crying situation? Mm -hmm. In Isaiah's Valley of Vision in Isaiah 22, part of the burden of that vision was the weeping and mourning of humanity. That's your diet in this world. Fourthly, embarrassment and reproach. It's escaped by no one. It hits us all. I don't care whether it's legitimate or otherwise. Any act, good or bad, is greeted with sarcastic hoots and hollows by your fellow man. No good deed goes unpunished in this realm. The world loves to embarrass you. Psalms 69 is about that. It's a profound portrait of this principle. As he says, we become a proverb and a song for drunkards. The reproaches of him that reproach God. Haven't they fallen on you? As they fell on Christ. That's the dot of this world. Bondage. This realm has produced an untold amount of slavery. I don't care whether it's physical, mental, emotional, spiritual. The slavery to sin engulfed us all. The entirety of human, uh, the human race. There is none righteous, no, not one. Mm -hmm. And now just for dessert, we're going to kill you. So we had them all die. That's the final course. A fitting dessert. I don't care how many billions are going to be spent to prolong it. I don't care how many billions of hours are spent researching it in stem cell research or whatever to certain things. We all die as our final dessert. Now, there's that wonderful six course meal. We have a little saying in East Texas that have had a better for We don't need any more of this diet. I'm ready for the rich friend. And so, bless by God's grace speak of that. So God, I say, Holy Spirit through Isaiah, 
What have you prepared for me? I'm going to let Isaiah tell you what it is. There's no need of me guessing. For in that same chapter of 25, that's verse 6 where he said, verse 7 and 8 and 9 tells you what it is. What do you got for us, God? What do you got for us, Holy Spirit? Talk to us, Isaiah. Instead of ignorance, I'm going to swallow up the veil that shrouds all my people. I'm going to get ignorance off of the menu. So it's just like the Lord consumed for the man on the mountain. The ignorance that has eaten up the world. The darkness that had covered the earth. And the only thing left was the light of the glory of God left to shine. What else is there for kind of a second round here? Instead of despair, he says, I'm going to swallow up the pall thrown over all the nations. Mm -hmm. Catch the irony of this. Jesus went <coughs> into the Eden for us. Catch that. The Lord is going to swallow up what the devil had to do. That's right. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. He said, took it. He took it. I'm going to swallow up the call from over all the nations. He just consumed many of Satan, cleaning out the kitchen, cleaning out Satan's banquet table, so that he can leave his joy to the world. The Lord has come. Or as Paul would say, rejoice evermore. Anything else, Lord? Oh yeah, we got a third menu. Instead of weeping, I'm going to wipe away the tears from every face. No more reason to cry here. The farmer things have passed away. Nor did you come to mind. That's Isaiah 25. This is Isaiah's assessment of God's rich power. Now all you that had to eat crow here, I'm going to remove the reproach of my people from the whole world. What's the next course here? Let me remove the chains of bondage. I am the Lord whom you have waited to deliver. And just for dessert, I'm just going to swallow up death. Mm -hmm. Every morning. <laughs> and just as the first fruit of this, you know, he promised man believing in me, he'll never die. Mm -hmm. Never be separated from God. Yeah. Wow, wow, wow. What a feast. See, this is Isaiah's just kind of initial assessment of this feat of fast, fast sacrifice. You know, you've got to bind a uh, strong man. So in this uh, metaphor, I, I admit these are metaphors, but they're pleasing to my spirit here yeah. that the that the old has to be gotten rid of. Yes. And it's just like Jesus consumed everything that the devil had to offer, that nothing but the good could be left. Now other prophets, you know, talk about this. Hosea just shout what a veil of troubles turned into a gate of hope. And really, the rest of Isaiah just kind of fleshes out describing this menu in a little bit greater detail. So he starts there in Isaiah, the second chapter. Now, it's on this mountain of the Lord's house. It's above all other mountains, you know. It's high above the hills that God will teach us His way. See, there, there goes the ignorance. Yeah. That's, that's taken care of. Not only did, God uh, did the Lord swallow up ignorance, but now God teaches us His ways here on this mountain. For you yourselves know that God has taught us. For you shall all know the Lord from the least to the greatest. Is that not? Know the Lord from the least to the greatest. Is that not rich? Amen. I don't think that people are rich. There on that mountain, instructions issued from the sign. Students are given a new heart. They're given a new spirit. Why students are even given a new mind here on that mountain. Given the mind of Christ. Given the mind of Christ. Is that not rich? Oh my. So with the mind of Christ, it's not presumptuous to think like God. With the mind of the Holy Spirit and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, it's not presumptuous to even act like God. Is that not rich? That's what we have to pray. Come, let us walk in the light of the Lord, says Isaiah. On Isaiah the fourth chapter, on that mountain, it's not vain to claim holiness. Mm -hmm. For those who are there shall be called holy. Right. Why don't you claim what you're called by the Lord Himself? 
Oh, that's rich. We can claim eternal life. Just talking to us just today. Uh, you know if you're going to be saved or not? And all the lot Well, here at Delta Mountain, part of the rich fair is those who are there, everyone is enrolled in the book of life. Just go ahead and claim that. Yes. Oh, that's a, that's a wonderful doctrine. There it be unreasonable to suffer shame and embarrassment. For glory shall be spread over all as a covering. That's what I said it for. Now Isaiah 9, how about the tears? Well, you know, here are tears, legitimate though they may be, are still in heaven. But since His hand is on the mountain, our joy is increased. We're given great and abundant gladness. Isaiah 9 again. On that mountain, rather than ignorance, we see His purpose. As I said, deadness shall not be such as was in the days of our vexation. Mm -hmm. We've seen the light. The Son of Righteousness is there. For unto us His Son is given. What's our reaction? Wonderful! See, that's, that's seeing something. Wonderful. Now Paul would say over in the New Covenant Scriptures, as he was reminiscing, about Jesus fulfilling all the prophecies of God just as, like Jesus to see a uh, prophet and just fulfill it. And Paul's saying, and that's of course our reaction. Wonderful as Isaiah said in the new covenant. Amen. I like that Jesus. Isaiah 26. There on that mountain. I don't have a million dollars for this one. There on that mountain. Even your works shall prosper. Because it is there that God bestows prosperity on us. For in truth, now Isaiah said this, the Holy Spirit said this through Isaiah, for in truth, all of our works are His doing. <laughs> you know, we don't have to be worried about filthy rags anymore. Amen. We're not interested in talking about filthy rags. We're talking about our works are His doing. Who Amen. wants to call God's work filthy rags? Okay. So Amen. our works are even fine. For the, it seems the filthy rags in this room, not up on that mountain, a piece of bad things. Isaiah 29. It is here that we are ashamed and are ignorant. But there, here's a quotation. It is not time nor the place to be ignorant or afraid because our confused minds will gain understanding. The obtuse will receive instruction. You remember Peter at uh, the uh, Calvary? A few days later, Pentecost, bold and profound. What's the difference? He moved on the mountain. That's all it is. He just changed from the diet of this world to the mountain's diet. The feast of fat things. There the eyes will not be clouded, the ears will hear, and the hearts will know and understand. Isaiah 32. See how it just fleshes out chapter after chapter about this rich fair. Time he gets to the third chapter, he says, Now look up on that mountain, the city of our feast of fat things. Let your eyes rest upon it. It's a land of comfort. There we have the Lord's majesty. Is that not rich? Amen. No man who dwells there will say, I'm sick. How do you get the fast? It won't make you sick there. Uh -huh. You can consume it all. And the more you consume, the more you enjoy it. Uh, that's not quite true here. Is it? You'll never say there, I'm sick. To those that dwell there, their sins will be pardoned. Here, as you waited on the Lord, as you well know, partaking of that fish, which fairy you gain you strength. Mount up with wings of eagles, run and not grow weary. March on and never grow faint. What a feast. And how do you get it? It is directly proportional to your faith and desire of it. Mm -hmm. To your faith and desire of it. It is available. Amen. Now, I don't want to track, but I want to be reasonable. I want to be practical. I want you. I want this to bring God's glory. You're still in the fight, mm -hmm. and I know that in God. Knows that. That's a reality, but it can bring God's glory also. And lay up yeah. treasures for yourself, mm -hmm. like the elder brother of the prodigal son, 
We talked to the prodigal son this morning, but we didn't talk about the elder brother. No. We are like him, often. We get drugged down off the mountain, and we go moping around to the Father, saying, Where are the blessings? Horror is the rich family. Horror is the dollar God. Now you know, and I know, it ain't gone anymore. It's still there. So the Father has to intervene. Sometimes weakly, sometimes a little strong, and says to the Son that got off of the mountain, everything of mine is your yeah, yeah. <laughs> What are you complaining about? Everything of mine is that. Is that not rich? Amen. Again, one says, but Brother Liam, don't we still suffer reproaches to the hardships and pressure for the world circumstances? How are we to deal with those? What are we to say? Let Paul's experiences shed light, Second Corinthians 12. After those visions of unspeakable glories, did he announce that he wanted to emphasize the glory in that man's vision? That wasn't his interest. But he did say, I will glory in my own weaknesses. And he named those weaknesses according to me, and I'm glad he did lest we think they were just a bunch of sins. No, I don't think that at all. And he mentioned in there insults, hardships, persecutions that he was experiencing. Mm -hmm. And said, I'm going to glory in me. Amen. Now what he just said, I am going to praise God when I'm persecuted. And I'm going to praise God when I'm insulted. And I'm going to praise God when I bear the reproaches of them that reproach Him. And why, Paul, would you want to do that? He says, it's going to keep my pride crucified and my humility acute. And God's grace is going to be sufficient and His power is going to be perfected. Paul precisely because of this residual hangover from Adam, was able to demonstrate the power of God. His thorn and your thorn is a thorn of the flesh. It is not a thorn of the Spirit. Amen. 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 And we need to understand that. The flesh weeps. The Spirit rejoices. The flesh is weak. The spirit is strong. The flesh is embarrassed. The spirit doesn't know the meaning of embarrassment. Now if it takes these circumstances to perfect God's power in my life, and it does, then I'm going to praise God for your and when I praise God for the feast of bad things, I'm also going to praise Him for letting these circumstances of life crucify my pride <coughs> and demonstrate to me that His grace is sufficient. Amen. Glory in man. Can you receive it? When you're counting your blessings and naming them one by one, I thank you, God, that they reproach me because of you. Amen. I thank you, God, they insulted me because of you. Amen. I thank you, God, that I cried because of you. Yes. So instead of moaning about it, praise God about it. Are you there? Amen. So when your good choices are coming under contact, when you're reviled blessed, when persecuted, when you're slandered, consider it. These keeps pride from having its way. Mm -hmm. See, that's our form in the flesh. But it's only the flesh, it's not the spirit. Now, see, is that, they, they, I love this. 
Then Paul, Paul called it a messenger of something. But God uses it for you to become exactly what Satan did not want. Remind him of it. It just had you taken away. Is that not rich? Amen. So the prophecy is fulfilled. Zephaniah 3 and 11. Never again shall you flaunt your pride in my holy mouth. Mm -hmm. Is that not rich? The way God worked that all. <coughs> so properly perceive then and receive God serves us up a diet of just the right circumstances to each one of us to fulfill this prophecy that we will not have pride or flaunt our pride in His holy mind. Now, when I see church people flaunting their pride, I know they're not over the night. Amen. I, I sense that. I praise God for it. Thus, even our problems, properly grasped, become part of the rich fair. So, all the to answer your question, do we still not have problems? Yeah, they're just part of the rich fair. You just got to understand them, you see. Because it develops in us and in you exactly what Satan did not want. Amen. But exactly what God did want. Amen. It brings you to glory and it brings God glory. So thank God, count among your blessings, that the world saw something in you. Saw something in your faith to rescue you. Not only have you been made better, but the angels have been educated by it too. Mm -hmm. Now surely you've just experienced it. You've already tasted the first fruits of this. And maybe you haven't realized it. But when someone insults you, what's your response? I'll promise you this is my response. What difference does it make? I know God. Mm -hmm. yeah. they, they haven't insulted. They just insulted the body man. And they're not getting by with even much of that. It's been insulted enough. I'm immune to that. that so so uh, even our righteous tears, by God, they're coming up as a memorial before God. That's just part of your treasures in heaven. Mm -hmm. You don't want to cry over crying. This, or maybe you do. The tears that are shed are for God's glory and your reward. Check it out. These are memorials before God. I'll promise you one thing when Stephen and the other martyrs carrying this thing to the extreme were stoned to death and beheaded. They did not wake up in heaven and say, Why me? Amen. Amen. So the only thing that remains are you dwelling on the mountain. Where the golden sunlight Far across this land of beauty, it far exceeds my fondest dreams. There the air is pure of earth, laden with bread of flowers, the blooming by the fountain, beneath the amaranth and bowers. Is not that the land of beauty? Blessed, blessed land of light, where the flowers bloom forever, and the sun. It's always bright. God bless you. Amen. 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 Amen.